Let's take a calm and objective look at what evolution is. Evolution. Any change in proportions of different genotypes in a population from one generation to the next. But what does that mean? Well, we'll come back to that. First, a short history on how and why evolution rose to become the cornerstone and foundation of modern biology. As early Europeans explored the newly discovered lands of Africa, Asia, and America, they found that the number of different life forms was much greater than anyone had suspected. Some of these closely resembled one another, yet differed in some characteristics. This led some people to believe that perhaps species could change, an idea that went against the dominant belief at the time that God created all organisms simultaneously as distinct, fixed life forms. But did you know that today, the worldwide scientific effort to catalog every living species on Earth is now over a million? And they're estimating that in the end, there will be about 1.75 million species. Well, as new lands were explored, excavations for roads, mines, canals, they revealed that many rocks occur in layers. In some cases, fossils that resembled parts of living organisms were found embedded within a given layer. As more and more fossils were discovered, it became obvious what they were. They were the remains of dead plants and animals that had died long ago and been changed into or in some way preserved in rock. After studying fossils carefully, British surveyor William Smith realized that certain fossils were always found in the same layers of rock, and that the organization of fossils and rock layers was consistent. One fossil type could always be found in a rock layer resting on top of another rock layer, which contained a different type of fossil, and so on. Furthermore, the fossils found in layers of rock close to the top consistently resembled more modern forms of life, as if nature had provided a ladder stretching back into time. Many of the fossils found were of species that had gone extinct. Following these discoveries came the inescapable conclusion that the different types of life forms had lived at various times in the past. French naturalist Georges Louis Clerc, Leclerc suggested that perhaps the original creation provided a relatively small number of founding species, and that some of the modern species had been conceived by nature and produced by time. But he didn't have any theory to explain that process, so people just kind of ignored it. When Europeans first started exploring, few scientists suspected that the Earth could be more than a few thousand years old and some people trying to count the generations in the Old Testament could only come up with uh, no more than 6,000 years. Georges Cuvier, a French paleontologist, came up with the theory of catastrophism to explain the fossil record. He suggested that a vast supply of species was created initially, but successive global disasters like the biblical flood produced the layers of rock and destroyed many species, fossilizing some of the remains in the process. However, if modern species have survived from an original creation, then many individuals of those species should have died in the ancient cat catastrophes. Surely some of them would have been fossilized and even, and even the lowest rock layers should contain at least a few fossils of present-day species. But unfortunately for Cuvier's hypothesis, they don't. Other ideas involving creation were also produced, but none could account for all of the evidence in the discoveries. The idea of an old earth became more and more popular. Geologists James Hutton and Charles Lyell came to the conclusion that, with forces such as wind, water, earthquakes, and volcanism, there was no need to invoke catastrophes to explain the findings of geology. Rivers in a flood lay down layers of sediment. Lava flows produce layers of basalt. Why would layered rock be anything other than a natural process occurring over time? If slow natural processes alone 
are enough to produce layers of rock thousands of feet thick, then Earth must be old indeed, many millions of years old. Today, the idea of an old Earth has been confirmed through, the, through a process known as radiometric dating. In the midst of all this, Charles Darwin was born. In his adult years, he became a brilliant English naturalist. Some biologists had already suggested that modern species could, have, could be explained if they had somehow come from pre-existing ones, but it wasn't until 1858 that Charles Darwin and Alfred Russell Wallace independently proposed that the mechanism for this change was natural selection. Evolutionary theory rose from observations and conclusions based on those observations. Here's a summary. It's possible for different populations of species to reproduce rapidly because each organism can have more than one offspring to replace each parent of the pre previous generation. Even though this potential exists, we see that natural resources such as food and water are limited, and yet they remain constant. So there must be competition for survival and reproduction. Each generation Many individuals must die young, fail to reproduce, produce few offspring, or produce offspring that fail to survive or reproduce. Individual members of a population differ from one another in their ability to obtain resources, withstand environmental extremes, escape predators, and other factors. So the ones that are best fit, uh, so the ones that are best able to survive are the fittest, and they will leave the most offspring. This is natural selection, the process by which the environment selects and determines whose traits best allow them to survive and reproduce in the particular environment. Now at least some of the traits that affect survival or reproduction must be due to genetic differences that may be passed on from one or both parents to the offspring. So over generations, reproduction among individuals with different genetic makeup, makeup changes the overall genetic composition of the population. And this whole process is called evolution by natural selection. In Darwin's day, he couldn't prove that the last part of, about traits being passed genetically from parent to offspring, but thanks to advances in the field of genetics, we know that that's true today. And that's what the definition says. Let's go back to that now. Evolution any change in the proportions of different genotypes in a population from one generation to the next. It's important to note that evolution cannot occur in an individual organism. It only occurs when the proportions of genotypes are changed in an entire population. One example that illustrates a change in the proportion of genotypes in a population over generations is a case that is known as Darwin's finches residents of the Galapagos Islands. The outcome of natural selection is sometimes easier to see in a relatively simple uh, isolated ecosystems of islands. For example, the Galapagos Islands are home to a group of closely related species of finches, each of which specializes in eating a different type of food. Natural selection has favored those individuals best suited to exploit each food source efficiently. The result is a wide range of beak sizes and shapes among otherwise similar birds. Some beaks are suited to cracking large seeds, like the large ground finch, some for small seeds, like the small ground finch, some for insects, like the warbler finch, and some for eating leaves, like the vegetarian tree finch and so on. Each species of finch has a beak that will accommodate their survival needs according to the environment they're in. But what's the evidence for evolution? How do we know evolution occurs? Well, first, the fossil record provides evidence of evolutionary change over time, including transitional fossils which show organisms with physical traits from two different species. Second, comparative anatomy, ana comparative anatomy provides structural evidence of evolution. Unrelated species in similar environments have evolved similar forms, like the penguin, which is a bird, and the seal, which is a mammal. 
Different species have very similar internal bone structures, and also many have structures that serve no apparent purpose, such as a panda's thumb. Third, embryological stages of animals can provide evidence of common ancestry, which basically means they develop in the same way. In their early embryonic stages, fish, turtles, chickens, mice, and humans all develop tails and gill slits, but only fish go on to develop gills, and only fish, turtles, and mice retain substantial tails, but the gill slits are in the DNA. 4. Modern biological and genetic analysis reveal relatedness among diverse organisms. All organisms use the same genes for giving instructions on developing the different parts of an organism like you're seeing in the example. Also, artificial selection, like dog breeding, shows that significant genetic changes in a population over generations do occur. This is evidence that the mechanism by which life evolves is through natural selection. Something that is important to keep in mind is that there is really only one category of organisms on Earth. That category is life. And life on Earth does not submit to our man-made terminology. When we categorize different species on the planet, this is simply our way of differentiating one form of life from another. There is no universal visual characteristic that separates one species from another. For organisms that rep reproduce sexually, the term species is defined as all organisms that are potentially capable of interbreeding under natural conditions. So, even when using the definition, there can be problems. For example, let's say that we have three types of organisms, and I'm not going to be creative, so let's call them A, B, and C, where types A and B can reproduce under natural conditions, and types B and C can reproduce under natural conditions, but types A and C cannot reproduce under natural conditions. This would be an example of a gray area where the boundaries of classification are blurred. So the distinction you make between different species isn't as solid as you'd like to believe. We created it to help our understanding, but in nature these distinctions don't necessarily exist because there are always exceptions and gray areas. The system we all know and learn uh, is the one that scientists use. But if you want, you can make your own classification system. Just take a bunch of pictures of different organisms and put them in groups, uh, as however you like. Classifying types of organisms helps us study them, but it's important to erase that classification system in order to get a more accurate picture of life on Earth. All life is changing little by little, and the more time goes by, the more change there is. Every form of life is a transitional form. When all of the little changes start to add up and affect an entire population, we call that evolution. In fact, all forms of life on Earth have something in common. All have DNA, and all have genes in common. The theory of evolution explains where all different variations of life came from, not where life itself came from. Although there are many theories, scientists have not been able to find an answer to the question, where did life come from? We just don't know. The steady mixing of genes through sexual reproduction along with random mutations that occur may not seem like much since the results aren't always visible, but with the earth being billions of years old and, life, uh, and animal life being 300 million years old, enough small changes over hundreds of millions of years would be uh, would be able to, to, to produce monumental changes in life several times over and this process is strongly supported with fossil and genetic evidence. Today evolution is the cornerstone of, of and foundation of modern biology. If you ask a biologist who spends most of their time in the field of studying animals about evolution they're going to respond as though it's a second nature to them, and it is. Evolution is so accepted in the scientific community, and the evidence for it is so solid, it has become the most basic and fundamental knowledge a biologist can have. 
which is why evolution is taught even to young teenagers in high school biology class. Knowing about evolution is as fundamental and important to biology today as knowing about Newton's laws of motions are to physics. This video was made uh, was mostly made to present what evolution actually is and to establish that it does happen. If it is still not clear to you what evolution is or if you're not sure how or where the fact that it does happen was established, uh, just post a comment in the comments section and I'll, I'll try to get to you. In another video, we're going to take a look at the details of, ev uh, of the evidence of evolution. We're going to take a look at a few ways that evolution can be falsified, and we're also going to touch on some of the mysteries and controversies that evolution has not been able to explain yet. There's lots, and scientists are still arguing about it. And uh, they're still ironing out the details and discovering new evidence and, and all sorts of stuff. Learning about science in any respect doesn't damage my faith in Jesus. Seeing God's creation didn't lead me to become a Christian either, but after being healed by God, seeing the Creator through His creation is absolutely amazing. It blows me away. If you made it to the end of this video and you're a creationist, thanks for watching and God bless. And feel free to post a comment or send me a private message. I'm happy to talk with you.